Welcome to another episode of the Wind Up Podcast. I am your host, Mike of MTGA Wines. Today we are getting into a, a topic that I've been teasing since I started doing this this year. And it's something that comes up regularly during tastings. It's something that is very prevalent throughout not just the wine industry, but the beverage industry as a whole. And we're going to get into it. And it's going to be a doozy, I think. And we're going to be talking about wine additives. All the things that winemakers have at their disposal to doctor up, quote unquote, enhance their wines and create the product that they're making. Now, this is something that could seem scary. And there's going to be probably some big words thrown around uh, that are basically kind of the chemical breakdown of some of these things. But I want to kind of err on the side of caution and start with the fact that a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about are naturally derived extracts, concentrates, enzymes, things of that nature. They're things that are not chemically produced. Would it be considered organic? No, because they've been processed in a way that's going to, you know, allow us to use them as an additive right? Uh, there are some of these things that are technically vegan. There are actually some of them that are technically organic as well. It, it's really, a lot of it's really not bad. And I know that might be hard to believe, but a lot of it's really not that big of a deal. There are a couple of things that we are going to touch on that could be a little more dicey, depending on which way you want to take it. And I'm going to start with an example that happened in the mid 80s, actually, that is was actually kind of a scandal in the wine industry and kind of, you know, was the starting point of a lot of, you know, regulation and other things when it came to winemaking, which, you know, is important. But another part of this is that there's a big lack of regulation, and especially when it comes to the US and labeling some of these things. Realistically, the labeling requirements in the US are very sparse. There are nine things, realistically, that we have to have on them. And I'm gonna list them off for you. Uh, we have the brand name, who made, who made the wine, uh, that bottler's name and address, where it was bottled. You have the varietal designation, or the class, or the type, like if it's a red wine or white wine blend, something of that nature. Uh, you have the appellation, or in the country of origin. So is it a Napa wine? Is it a Willamette Valley wine? Is it an Oregon wine? Is it California? Does it come from the US? Does it come from France? So on and so on, right? You have the alcohol content, Duh. You have the vintage date, if applicable. You can also put a non-vintage on there if it's blended from multiple vintages. Think champagne does non-vintage or ports and things do non-vintage wines all the time. That's usually stated on there, though. Uh, you have the net volume of contents. That's why you have the 750 milliliter number on there, or you have the 1.5 liter number on there when it comes to like magnums and things like that. You have the sulfite declaration. This product may contain or does contain sulfites. Just heads up, we'll get into sulfites as well during this. And then you have the government health warning statement, which is, you know, that lovely little government warning that's on the back of every alcoholic beverage, right? So uh, that's it. We don't need to label any of this other stuff. And, you know, there's a lot that can go into making these wines. Again, the vast majority of it are things that are natural extracts and concentrates and things. There are very few things that are, I think, really sketchy, realistically. However, you know, all of these things can be used to make your wine a certain way. And the analogy that I use for this, and if you've sat down in the cellar for with a tasting uh, with me personally, you've heard me say this, and that there's a reason why a Big Mac tastes like a Big Mac. It is engineered to taste that way. If you went into, you know, McDonald's and got yourself a Big Mac, but it tasted like a whopper, 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 junior double, triple whopper, you'd be kind of, you'd be like, what is this? This is not what I'm paying for. If you went to the grocery store and you wanted a Coca-Cola, but it ended up tasting like a Pepsi, you'd be like, wait, this isn't what I bought. So at a certain point, you know, as you're making a food or a beverage, you're trying to have some level of consistency to it, right? And especially if you're mass producing it, you have to be able to replicate it kind of day in, day out, year in, year out. And a lot of these substances, are how producers do that. Here's the caveat. 
you immediately think of like, oh, well, they're, these are mass producers. These are wines that are, you know, millions of cases of wine are made by some of these companies. Like, of course they have to use these additives because that's how they make it consistent. They don't worry about the vintage. They don't worry about the vineyard, maybe not even the grapes they're using. What they care about is being able to make that wine taste the same year in and year out. And they can use a whole bunch of things to do that, right? The problem is, is that small producers do it too. They won't tell you they do it, but they sure do. And the reality is, is they're probably not going to tell you unless you're on the inside of the industry and you just happen to know. And, in, and a lot of the big producers aren't going to tell you either, right? Some of you may remember the, you know, battle that was fast food restaurants posting their like nutritional facts and values within the restaurant, right? There was a lot of pushback. It's like, we don't really want people to know, you know, what's behind the curtain in that burger. The same goes with wine and alcoholic beverages in general. And there are large lobbies and companies that make sure that those laws don't change, right? That those labeling requirements that I listed off are the labeling requirements and nothing else is deemed necessary. Now, I got a question from a, some, a really good group of friends and club members uh, a little while ago about, you know, why, why not just label it? Like, you're the producer, you know what went into it, you can label your own kind of table of contents and say, hey, this is what we put in our wine. And there have been a handful of producers that do that. And the reaction from consumers was very negative. It was, you know, sales drop. They're like, oh, like this wine has all these things in it. You know, what is this, you know, you know, yeast that they're putting into it. What is this that they're putting into it? And it created not, you know, panic or anything like that, but it's like, oh, they're labeling what's in here. Like, they, obviously, they must be doing something else, and some of these things might not be that great. It's like picking up a bag of hot Cheetos, and you look at that table of contents, you're like, damn it, you're delicious, but that's a lot of stuff that I don't understand. And it did more harm than good for many of those brands. So you know, for like MTGA, why don't I label, you know, some of the things that we use is one, I talk about them all the time, you know, on this podcast or in the cellar. And, you know, we use grapes, yeast, maybe some yeast vitamins, if you know, that wine doesn't have enough nutrients for that fermentation to go through. Uh, we use barrels, we use a very low dose of sulfites. That's it. That's everything that I use in my winemaking. And I'm transparent about that, I think, enough when I talk about my wines, because it's typically in front of the people that are consuming it. You know, my wines are not available, you know, in grocery stores and restaurants around the country, around the world. So for me, it's less of an issue because I can dial that in with people one on one. Uh, I am one of those people that if we needed to start labeling ingredients, you know, more specifically, I would be happy to do so. If that law came to pass, I would be all about it. I think it's going to be a long time coming before we see that. So let's get into this, shall we? And the that's kind of the, the background behind a lot of this, why, you know, some of this stuff is used. And also, you know, realistically, the re, you know, yeah, the reason why it's used, you know, it's to it's for consistency in making that product what it is supposed to be, right? Uh, now, I want to get in and start with, you know, one kind of, cautionary thing is that some of this might seem a little scary. There are going to be some, you know, things that we talk about that's like, I, and I don't want to freak you out here, but these are things that I feel, you know, as an industry, we need to be more transparent about. So we're going to get into it. And a lot of it, again, is not going to be that scary. Some of it's going to have some names that just sound kind of ridiculous. Uh, but realistically, it's stuff that, again, is not going to be toxic to you. It's going to be stuff that's, you know, a, a product that is naturally derived from some other organic product and it's processed to be able to be used in wine uh, outside of a couple of exceptions. Uh, so I want to start with a story. Let's start with a story, shall we? So let me, I'm sorry, you're going to see a little bit of my notes here. Let's uh, move that. There we go. So let's start with a story. And this is the story of a 1985 wine scandal in Austria. 
This is the good stuff. This is just from Wikipedia, so you can look this up if you would like. Uh, during the month of July 1985, Austrian wines were found to contain up to 1,000 parts per million of DEG. That is diethylene glycol, for those that don't, don't know what that is. That's also one of them big, scary words. Uh, Austrian wine was banned in many countries, and the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms started to test all imported wine. In November, the New York Times published a wine recall the federal government released after the bureau tested a thousand bottles 45 austrian five german and 12 italian wines tested positive for it uh, some wines contain less than 10 parts per million a small amount that could not be detected by laboratory analysis in europe this triggered the installation of more sensitive laboratory equipment in laboratories for stronger alcohol regulations after recalling millions of wine bottles the austrian government experienced difficulty finding a way to destroy the product it's a long, longer story than that. But there's a difference between diethylene glycol, uh, which is a compound that is in essence used in antifreeze because it has a lower freezing point than water. It's not good for you. But there is also something known as propylene glycol, glycol, just a different name in front of it, that is used in food and drugs. And this actually, uh, kind of came there's like that little tiny scandal of like fireball that flavored whiskey that people were like oh my god it has antifreeze in it well this was the difference uh the reason that this uh diethylene glycol was added was because it does add a little bit of viscosity and almost like sweetness to the wine so it added body to the wine uh amongst you know some other reasons why they were doing it. but that's you know main contributing factor uh this one that's actually used in the food and drug world uh is safe for human consumption it's not toxic like the one that's actually used in antifreeze uh it's used in everything from coffee based drinks liquid sweeteners ice cream whipped dairy products soda and so on uh, many pharmaceutical drugs which are insoluble in water use this as a solvent and a carrier uh again this stuff, you can look up the propylene glycol as well as the diethylene glycol. You know, I'll have some links down below as well for these guys. Uh, but this was that scandal uh, in wine and that something was being used as an additive, specifically in Austria at this time, uh, that should not have been. Uh, so this was kind of one of those scary moments in history where you're like, oh my God, there's stuff in here that really should not be in here. And then you had other things that are like, oh, this has a slightly similar similar name, but it's a very different compound when it's all said and done. So I wanted to use this 1985 wine scandal in Austria, as well as this propylene glycol example, because those are two kind of terms that you look at them, you're like, both of those things sound really bad. And then as soon as you mix in the word antifreeze, you're like, oh my God, what is happening here? Uh, but at a chemical level, these two are very different, right? So this is kind of the cautionary tale here is make sure you know what this stuff actually is, how you're using it, and why it's being used. Uh, this is that cautionary tale as well as the like, hey, this sounds scary, but it's not nearly as big of a deal as you think it might be. So keep that in mind as we're going through some of these products is that we're going to err on the side of it's really not the antifreeze you're thinking of. We're looking at the food and drug applications of a lot of this stuff. And again, this is where I'm probably going to scare some of you. And I apologize, but like this is, there's a big difference between these two things. And this is the kind of stuff that we're going to focus on is like what can actually be used in food and beverages and what is regulated very heavily that cannot be, right? All right. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, about that. Okay, so uh, we got through the labeling requirements. Now let's go through some of the kind of most prevalent wine additives. And some of these are not going to be a surprise to any of you. Uh, these are things that we've talked about realistically in previous podcasts, but these are technically additives that we use in winemaking. And let's talk about probably the most controversial of them first. Sulfites. Sulfur dioxide, SO2. Uh, this is something that is used to kill unwanted yeast, bacteria, and things. It acts as a preservative. Now, we've 
already covered this, but I want to reiterate it, that wine has some of the lowest levels of sulfites that you can find in products that actually use this. Uh, things like candy, juices, dried fruit, in particular uh, packaged meats, use much higher doses of sulfites as a preservative. So realistically, sulfites are not the issue here. The reason that sulfites are labeled is because there's roughly 1% of the population that can have an allergy or sensitivity to sulfites, and it is a serious one. And as a result, it's labeled so that people know to avoid them, right? That makes sense. So, you know, it is something that is regulated. Uh, there's a certain level of sulfites and a limit to what we can add to our wines. Uh, very typically uh, when bottled, you know, for us, we're looking at 30-ish parts per million uh, when the wine is stable. We also have typically very low, we have lower pH levels, which allows the wine to be more stable. So we don't have to use as many sulfites. There's, you know, some of the you know chemical background of like as to what chemistry background, I should say, as to why we only use X amount. Uh, the you know parts per million and some of these other products much higher as you might expect so you, you know that's a very common one but it's used all over the f you know food and beverage industry and has been since the 80s realist and i think maybe even longer than that actually uh yeast this should come as no surprise. We add yeast for our fermentations. Now, there are folks that do rely on those natural fermentations. We are going to have, uh, you know, the natural wine talk at some point uh, as well during this show. Uh, but we add yeast for the fermentation process. It's technically an additive because we need those yeast cells to convert the sugar into alcohol as well as heat and carbon dioxide and whatnot. Uh, now, here's get, let's get into a couple of things that maybe you're a little bit less familiar with let me bring these up onto the screen here so ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba 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 -ba. oh my gosh i had this all queued up and like ready to go and now i'm messing with it all right whoops minimize that oh my gosh i'm totally screwing this up I had this all ready to go and I closed the tab that I had open. Oh, goodness. You know what? We're just going to run with it. I screwed up. We're going to ignore that. <laughs> I had a really good little slide. Oh, and I totally screwed up. All right. So I'm just going to talk about it. Uh, so we have three things here that we're going to talk about that are all naturally derived uh, from some of the grapes and barrels and things that we use, uh, but can be added. So let's look at tannins. We can look at sugar. And we can look at acid. So let's start with the tannin side of things. Now, tannins obviously naturally come from uh, the seeds, the skins, the stems uh, in grapes. But let's say you don't have enough tannin in your wine. You want more structure in your wine. You can add that. You can basically get uh, powders and things that you can add to your wine to enhance the tannin profile. And that's naturally derived from the seeds typically of grapes. Uh, so again, a natural additive uh, It's not uncommon for people to add tannin to increase the structure of their wine, something that we clearly don't do uh, because I don't deem it necessary for our wines. Uh, but it's a possibility. Uh, you can also use uh, oak chips. And this is also an additive that you can use instead of, say, aging in oak barrels. Now, we talk about the expense of brand new barrels all the time. And outside of grapes, typically your barrels are your next biggest cost center when it comes to producing wine. But if you're trying to make a wine that's on a dime, you can't afford to buy those barrels. And there's also the argument to be made that you know, using some of these chips and sawdusts and things of that nature are much more eco-conscious as well. They require a little bit more processing, but you're not shipping these giant pieces of wood all over the world. Uh, you know, there's a lot less labor that goes into it and things of that nature. However, you're not necessarily getting the intricate complexities uh, that you might get from a new barrel. So take that for what you will. Uh, but you can use oak chips. Uh, those can also help stabilize the color of a wine. They can help add some of those oakier characteristics. Uh, you can, in essence, have some of these oak chips kind of enhanced with certain flavors, whether that be cherry or chocolate or vanilla or whatever, and add those to the wine so it enhances those characteristics even more. You're kind of flavoring the wine uh, with these chips and, and whatnot to provide that extra punch of flavor rather than letting it sit in a brand new oak barrel for a couple of years. Uh, 
you know, not uncommon, again, derived directly from the oak that we're already using anyway, uh, and then flavored to enhance other certain characteristics. Yeah, is what it is. Uh, acidity. If you want a wine to be more refreshing, have more tartness, uh, you can add acidity. Now, typically, as I understand it, you're not adding uh, citric acid because it can cause issues. Uh, it can cause issues, and also there's very little citric acid typically uh, in grapes. You're mostly going to be adding tartaric acid, uh, which is something that is, uh, geez, it's just something that is one of the fixed acid groups, group, uh, fixed acid that's found in grapes. You have tartaric acid, you have uh, malic acid, which you know gets converted to lactic acid through that uh, malolactic conversion that we talk about all the time, and then you have a little bit of citric acid to kind of round it out. Now, the reason acid is typically used is not so much, you know, maybe it is for the overall structure of the wine, but it also helps adjust the pH level. At a certain point, if your pH level is too high, your wine becomes unstable. But what you can do is add tartaric acid in a certain volume to reduce that pH level. So instead of using, you know, high doses of preservatives and things of that nature, you can actually increase the stability of your wine by adding a natural acid derivative to your wine and make it just more stable. Realistically, not such a bad thing when you think about it, right? You're like, oh, this is something that's naturally found in grapes. You simply add that product to your wine to make it more stable and increase the acidity and decrease that pH level, and there you go. Uh, this is something that is widely used uh, throughout the industry around the world. Actually, all three of the, these things you know, uh, that we're talking about here. And the last one is gonna be sugar. Now, sugar is something that can be a, maybe a little bit more controversial, I guess. Uh, now, the trick about sugar is this is not like, well, it depends on where we are and what we're talking about. Because certain states, like let's talk about Oregon versus California. As far as I know, uh, you can actually add like cane sugar to wines in Oregon. Uh, it's typically done because you have a harder time getting your fruit to ripen up. The same thing could be said in Bordeaux or Burgundy or in other, other regions of the world. Uh, and if you're adding that sugar, it increases the sugar level, the overall ripeness of said wine, and then you get a slightly higher alcohol, le alcohol level when you end up fermenting it. Uh, now in California, it is illegal to add straight cane sugar to your wines. It is something we cannot do, cannot do uh, here in the great state of California. But what can we do? We can add concentrates. So this is when we get into kind of our next round of additives that can be used. And concentrates, some of you may have heard the terms mega red or mega purple. You can Google either of those. Uh, but they're made, uh, mega purple in particular is made by a subsidiary of Constellation Brands here in California. It's a cheap, almost syrup from red wine grapes. Uh, almost think of it like, you remember like the frozen like orange juice tubes in the grocery store that you just add water to to make orange juice? Kind of the same thing. Uh, it's a processed grape concentrate uh, that allows you to add sugar to your wine without having to use cane sugar. It's basically the loophole, right? Uh, and since it's derived from grapes, again, kind of less of an issue. The thing is, is that this mega purple or mega red um, and anything that kind of is, is in that realm uh, adds not just the sugar, but also color and flavor. So if you're looking to darken up your wine, make it richer and deeper looking, maybe you add that mega purple. I mean, it's actually like dark purple, like it's going to add color to your wine. Uh, it can if you have a wine that might have come in like a little bit underripe, it has some greener characteristics to it, this will help mask some of those characteristics. And that sugar and that sweetness realistically is going to make the wine fill out and sexier and rounder because this is stuff that can be added, not just during, say, a fermentation process, but afterwards as well to, again, enhance, depending on who you ask, that particular wine. So, you know, a lot of it is typically used for a little bit of that, you know, extra sugar content as well as the color, not so much flavor because you want to rely on your wine more so than this for it. But it does have, of course, an impact on that as well. So uh, Mega Red, same thing, different color, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, basically the same thing, just different color. Um, now... This is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. Let me bring up my notes here real fast. 
This one I actually had prepared, but I'm going to be re reading off it of it ever so slightly. Now, <laughs> if this is kind of like rapid fire, like let's get after these additives and see what we can do. And so far we've covered stuff that's, you know, natural extracts, concentrates, things of that nature. And we have a few more of those to do, but we're going to get into some an animal products. One it, that may come as a surprise to some of you would be egg whites. Uh, egg whites are used as a fining technique uh, for uh, helping you know, reduce tannin in your wine. Uh, those tannins can bind with the proteins in the wine and fall out of solution. It can also remove other proteins from your wine. Uh, it just helps kind of clarify and make your wine uh, you know, more, I guess, stable. Uh, this is a very old school technique. This is something that is done regularly and realistically it's egg whites. You can use organic eggs if you want to. Uh, this is not nothing that should come too much as a surprise and realistically that is all filtered out anyway. You're not gonna just keep that stuff floating around in there. Something that's a little bit more interesting but kind of does the same thing is icing glass, uh, which is the extract from a uh, bladder of a fish. I think it's a sturgeon that's typically used. Does the same thing but helps reduce tannin quite a bit and that falls out of solution again is filtered out now you can also use uh, I'm gonna pronounce this probably incorrectly uh, but protease I think it is which is derived from a uh, pig or cow stomachs uh, that are used to remove certain proteins so there are even you know animal products that we can use again that are naturally de you know derived from these creatures that we can use in our wines to you know remove certain proteins remove tannin and basically fine or clarify our wines uh, some of these, it's this is like really interesting stuff to me because I'm like, man, this is like going down the rabbit hole of things you can use uh, when it comes to kind of stabilizing and clarifying your wine. Now, the th reason why I bring up the animal product side of things is because typically if you're a practicing vegan, let's say, or you like to avoid animal products, this is super important, right? And this is where the labeling conversation for me really starts to pick up is that there are likely certain things, especially when it comes to say these animal products that people might want to know if their wines are, you know, fine with these. Now, the caveat to this is that the filtration that is used to remove these products, there's going to be nothing remaining, right? Like you're not going to have like an egg white floating around your wine. That's not how this works, okay? Uh, you're not gonna have the extract of the you know, fish bladder floating around your wine. Your wines are obviously filtered and all of this stuff is removed from those wines. So this is not something to worry about having like this, you know, in a wine floating about. If that is the case, someone screwed up immensely and they should probably be fired. Uh, but typically if you're using some of these finding agents and things, you're going to be filtering these wines anyway, and all this stuff is going to get removed. So it's up to you to decide, you know, again, you know, is this something knowing that it's used in some wines, and then maybe you know that it's used like uh, Opus One, for example, has been using egg whites for finding forever. I don't, I, they used to, I don't know if they still do, but that was something that was a very traditional technique that they would use. You know, good on them. It's, you know, it is what it is. It's part of their stylistic process. Um, do I not drink Opus One because of egg whites? No, not typically. It's just I, not my favorite wine in the world. It's still really good. It's very, very popular, but it's just not to my taste buds. The egg whites have no bearing on whether or not I buy that wine. Uh, but for some people, it might have. Uh, for others, it may be the same thing with, you know, icing glass uh, and other, you know, finding agents that we use. And this is kind of, this is really where my argument for a little bit more regulation when it comes to you know, what people are putting into their wines and how they're finding them and how they're producing them. Uh, because, you know, this stuff is important. And even if it's naturally derived from a, a plant or a creature, you know, it's still things that you're adding to something. And I believe that consumers have a right to know what they're putting into their bodies. Kind of that simple. Now, for what we've we covered a lot, very quickly, very rapid fire. And again, I want to preface that this is the tip of the iceberg. There are all kinds of other things that we can use, but these are very prominent and things that are a little bit more out in the open and easier to do some research on. Uh, the more you get into enzymes and finding agents, it becomes more like geeky technical data sheets that you have to, you know, 
have you know a degree in chemistry it feels like to really figure out what's going on here uh, there is a really great site uh, that i do want to show you that if you are looking for more information on some of these things this is by no means going to be a complete list but this is a company uh, that operates around the world and provides some of these products to winemakers and other beverage industries so if you want to go through kind of the their product offerings and kind of what in essence ends up being a glossary uh this is the website that's probably gonna you're probably gonna want to go to and i'll put a link to this as well uh when you know in the video description so let me move the camera a little bit oh wait that was the wrong thing what the hell's going on here i'm having all kinds of technical difficulties on this one. Oh, that's what i did okay i picked the wrong one wait why is it not showing up Oh my gosh, what happened? I did something and I broke it. Damn it. Okay, well, technical difficulties aside. Oh, I was doing so well until I screwed up my notes and this thing. Okay, well, here we are. Uh, there's a company called Anartis. Uh, and I'll put a link to the Anartis website uh, in the description. And that has basically you know, whatever you need for your winemaking, uh, from fermentation products, maturation products, uh, different kinds of in innovations. Uh, you got all kinds of things uh, that you can use when it comes to wine and winemaking. And for us, this is a really great resource to know what our options are, even if you're someone like me who's not gonna use them, you know, this is, you know, a place that a lot of winemakers go to order some of these products and buy them. So, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, kind of is, you know, kind of just for more information if you're looking for it. Yeah. So I'm going to look up a couple of things here real quick uh, to get into the next thing, the next topic. And this is two things uh, that are, you know, maybe could be a little bit more, I, I suppose, controversial uh, but again, are they typically naturally have a half-life or are filtered out and removed uh, from wine as well. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is copper sulfate. Uh, this is, in essence, comes in the form of like a blue juice. Uh, and it's not juice. Do not, for the love of God, don't drink it. Um, <laughs> that is used as a fining agent uh, to remove H2S. Uh, that's, those are hydrogen sulfides uh, that can create, when they're really bad, it creates uh, reductiveness and even like a rotten egg type smell in your wine. And what this does is it converts uh, the hydrogen uh, hydrogen sulfide into copper sulfide, which is not soluble. It does not, it won't be in solution. It actually falls out and settles out uh, as sediment basically. So even though this is something that you shouldn't be drinking, at, on its own, it falls out of solution and it can be filtered out and removed from that wine. So, uh, and again, the filters that we use at a micron level, I mean, you're removing, you know, easily yeast cells, if not like bacteria and things for like sterile filtering, there's no shot that this sediment is going to get through there. So this is something that is used regularly to help reduce reductiveness and these hydrogen sulfides, which can create a lot of off aromas and things in your wine. Uh, it is something that I've seen more so in, in larger productions uh, In smaller productions. Uh, it tends to be less of an issue. I feel like it's not, it's been an issue that we've had a couple of times, but this is not a substance we've had to use because we've simply been able to use uh, a copper bowl like during racking and that helps knock that out as well as a little bit of air time and uh, shaking up that wine kind of gets rid of it for us so um, there's really nothing as opposed to using an additive there are a couple other like little tricks of the trade that you can use that kind of knock this right out now this is definitely more of like you're having big issues with this particular comment you need to knock it out that's when you bring in the heavy hitter and you make it work for you uh, so that is the copper sulfate it typically comes in i think a one percent solution uh, so it's very very diluted as well but it's enough to remove and break down 
that hydrogen sulfide and convert it to something else that you can actually remove from your wine through a filtering process. So very handy, uh, something that is more of like the additive that you would think it is because it's not a natural derivative of anything that ha comes from like our barrels uh, or our grapes and things of that nature. So uh, this is something that if you want to look it up, you can look it up. Uh, you can even go to uh, morewinemaking.com uh, and check out the product. It'll show you a little bit of information on it and how it works. Uh, and it's quick and easy to purchase if, even for home winemakers if you're having that issue but definitely you know read the instructions of how to apply it and also how to remove it from your wine when it's all said and done now the last one is i wore a shirt specifically for it uh and it is a compound called dimethyl dicarbonate also known as velcrin or as i call it the death star <laughs> uh this is in essence, this is a substance that has been used, I think, since 1988, when it's all said and done. Uh, it's been widely used in the beverage industry almost as a whole. You're talking about flavored beverages, uh, everything from sweet teas to hard seltzers, things like Gatorade, and so on and so forth. This is not something that is specific to the wine industry. It's used in the beverage industry as a whole. And the reason why is used is that it basically sterilizes your product. Once you add this thing, ain't nothing living in there. Uh, you're killing off any yeast, you're killing off any bacteria. It's basically the nuclear option for your beverage. Now, you might think, and rightfully so, that if that's what you're adding to the wine, it can't be good for you. And here's the thing. In high doses, on its own, it's certainly not. In fact, it is poisonous. You typically, it's very toxic. You ha typically have to wear a hazmat suit and you have a special device to actually apply it to your beverage. Uh, it is not really for the faint of heart to just jump in and use. You need to be able to be safe and very conscientious of this product because it can kill you in high doses. Now, you ha with these very strict application measures of how it's applied to these beverages, as long as those are followed, and this is a study that I'm gonna post uh, in the comments as well. This is a study from the European Food Safety Authority. It's a journal uh, from 2015 that reevaluated the safety of uh, dimethyl dicarbonate in beverages, and it was done in lab tests in mice and rats specifically. And the conclusion, conclusion, long story short, and you can read the study for yourself if you click the link down below, was that it was in when applied in the right correct concentrations it actually hydrolyzes hyd oh man i can't believe i messed that up hydrolyzes goes through hydrolysis um I th yeah hydrolyzes and breaks down into other compounds that are not harmful i swear to god every once in a while i swear i have dyslexia and words just get jumbled up uh but it after X amount of time, it has in essence a half-life and it breaks down and it breaks down and it breaks down and turns into things like methanol and carbon dioxide, which are two things that aren't harmful, uh, correct, you know, in, in very small, very, very small proportions. So the theory is that yes, this substance, when you add it and when it's in a concentrated form, it is outrageously toxic and lethal. However, after X amount of time, that half-life takes over and it degrades into things that are safe for consumption. Uh, this is something that I'll also post the link to this particular substance, uh, the website and the company who makes it. So if you're interested in seeing what this particular uh, thing is all about and see their YouTube videos of how great their product is or how they think it is, more power to you uh it's again just want to give you a resource uh, so that you can potentially kind of understand what this product is um also the study down below uh, uh to show you know what the uh efsa's you know findings were in 2015 uh, and then of course the uh basically the web shop for an artist so you can see some of these other finding agents and enzymes and concentrates and things that can be utilized so um you know velcarin uh, dimethyl dicarbonate is something that um i think you know i don't have i've not done the scientific study to back it up but my general opinion is that if i have to ha wear a hazmat suit to put it into my wine i don't really want to put it into my wine so we do everything that we can uh, from, you know, 
other avenues to make sure that our wine is going to be as stable as possible and not have to use the Death Star on it to blow up everything that's in there. Um, I don't want to go much too further into it than that uh, because it is something that um, it, it can be controversial for some. You know, there are plenty of folks that are like, oh, yeah, this is something that obviously degrades and you don't have to worry about. It. And then there are those of us that are like, yeah, but, you know. Uh, there are plenty of substances that were made by very large companies that were deemed safe in the past, only to find out much later that they weren't, in fact. And this one, uh, given the uh, given the dangers of it in its concentrated form, uh, something that you know that I'm not willing to toy with. Uh, the bi biggest example of this is probably Monsanto and the use of Roundup, you know, and the fact that it is in fact carcinogenic and causes cancer, which was found out obviously in the last couple of years. Uh, if you really want to go down a rabbit hole of that, uh, check out uh, where Roundup came from. It might be a substance called uh, Agent Orange from the Vietnam War that was slowly converted into DDT, DDT and then eventually into Roundup. Long story short, sidebar but important to know if you're using weed killers in your backyard. So, you know, this is this is the kind of stuff that we winemakers have access to, that the beverage and the food industry have access to. And there are going to be many people that use everything from, you know, mega purple and mega red to oak chips uh, to, you know, some of these animal products like egg whites or icing glass, or they're going to be using copper sulfate and Velcrin. Uh, there's all kinds of things. You know, there's a laundry list. There's far too many to cover in, in one show. And again, some of this could have been, some of them are probably not that big of a deal. You figure out like, okay, like grape concentrate and sugar, oak chips, not that big of a deal. Acid, not that big of a deal. Those are all like naturally derived from these things that we're already using. Animal products, okay, maybe a little bit more give and take there. Maybe I don't really want animal products in my wine. They are filtered out. Keep that in mind. They are filtered out. So, you know, really, in the grand scheme of things, not that big of a deal if you're, unless you're really trying to avoid things that, you know, animal products are used in. You know, no harm, no foul there. Just, again, good to be aware of. Uh, copper sulfite, sulfate, uh, again, something that is easily filtered out and removed from your wines. Velcrin, you know, we are told that it has this, you know, half-life and that it degrades and that it's no longer an issue. And it's been used and approved uh, since the late 80s in all kinds of industries outside of just wine. So, you know, it's something that has multiple applications to it, you know, but this is some of the stuff that we have access to. And, you know, again, this is very much the tip of the iceberg when it comes to additives and finding agents but these are some of the the heavy hitters some of the popular ones that are used and used regularly throughout the issue uh, throughout the industry uh, do some of them cause issues potentially uh, realistically everything that's approved for us to use and everything that is heavily regulated like everything that we talked about uh, all of it is regulated and all of it is approved for use in the food and beverage industry is you know which includes the wine industry of course, and the regulations are no joke. Um, you know, I typically do have some skepticism on, you know, what the FDA approves. Um, I typically have some skepticism on some of these products and whether or not they quote unquote need to be used, uh, which is why we don't use any of them. You know, uh, that's something that I've tried to stay true to is that I'm not going to be the quote unquote natural winemaker where uh, we do everything. We just let the wine make itself. I want to use a little bit of intervention when it comes to things like yeast and nutrients for the yeast to get through those fermentations. I want to be able to use sulfites as a preservative to make sure my wine stays stable uh, for a longer period of time. But that's all that I want to use. There's nothing else that I really want to dive into unless I don't have to. Uh, there have been moments where we've had to filter our wines more heavily to make sure that they stay stable. Um, and that's really the only other thing. Uh, but again, you know, we're a small producer. Uh, these are things that I typically don't have to worry about because, you know, I do everything that I can to not have to use any additives. I'm also not trying to replicate the same wine year in, year out, no matter what vineyard I'm using, no matter what Mother Nature is doing. I'm okay with variability within our program as long as the wines are consistent. They don't need to be identical, but consistency is important. If you are looking to replicate the same wine over and over and over and over again, there's a pretty decent chance that you're going to end up using some of these products 
And especially if you're mass producing a wine and it needs to be shelf stable around the country or around the world, even more so in that case. But again, there are always exceptions and there are plenty of small producers that use everything that we just listed, uh, if not a good chunk of it when it's all said and done. So uh, I hope that this episode wasn't too scary. Uh, It's kind of all over the place. I feel like this was like a barrage of information. Like I just like word vomited all over uh, when it came to some of these things, especially starting off with that, you know, story in Austria and the difference between those two, uh, two uh, glycols. Uh, You know, context does matter. And the chemical breakdown of these substances do matter, especially in a situation like that, where it's easy to potentially confuse those two things. Uh, Again, there's uh, links down below if you want to do a little bit more of a deep dive on some of these things. Uh, I'm fully expecting there to be some more questions and uh, things that we want to really dive into specifically. Uh, Again, it's it's probably a little weird that we don't have to label some of these things. It's pretty weird that it seems like it's it seems like it's unregulated because we don't label it. But the reality is, is that on the back end of things and what we can add and how much we should be or want to be, uh, especially when it comes to certain things, uh, when it comes to like sulfites or uh, Velcrin or uh, copper sulfate, you know, those are all very heavily regulated and things that we pay that, you know, wineries pay very great attention to because, you know, they can be a big problem if you don't adhere to the rules and the dosage that you're supposed to be utilizing. Uh, But the same thing goes for mega purple or mega red. Like if you add too much of that concentrate, you got a wine that's going to be super sweet, super purple, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, I, I guess if I'm going to form a kind of one last little opinion, you know, to kind of close this out, it's that this is a to each their own kind of thing. And again, this is where you as a consumer probably unfortunately have to do a little bit of the heavy lifting because there's no labeling regulations with any of this stuff. Uh, we do not have to label any of this other than the sulfites. And if you really want to know whether or not some of this stuff's being used in the products you're drinking, you got to do the research. And it's a pain in the ass, and it probably should be a little bit more transparent, uh, but it's not. So I'm hoping that this episode kind of shined a light on that a little bit. Again, I still love a Big Mac every once in a while. I don't care how processed it is. They're still damn delicious, right? And as consumers, we get to make the choice as to what level of risk we take when we put certain things into our bodies. Uh, Whether it's a Big Mac, whether it's a glass of wine, uh, whether it's another uh, (laughs) substance of choice, uh, whatever the case may be. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Of course, as always, any questions, comments, things you want to know more about, uh, we'll still be doing our end of the month Q and A's. I'll try and wrap up as many questions as I can. Uh, This is this is a tough topic to get into because there's so much to cover. And the I think we did a pretty good job of getting through kind of like the the big things that apply to the wine industry and the beverage industry as a whole. You know, it's not just wine that's doing a lot of this stuff. It's all other beverage industries as well as food industries that are using some of these products to enhance what they do and how they do it and things of that nature. So thanks so much for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day.